From the United Nations Office to the African Union, this is She Stands for Peace, a podcast series where I explore the state of the women peace and security agenda in Africa through a series of conversations with key actors. In the podcast, we ask the central question, 20 years after UNSCR 1325, how far have we come? I am Dr. Yemisi Akimobola, your host, and today I'm joined by Dr. Pumzile Mulabu Nguka, the United Nations Undersecretary General and Executive Director of UN Women. Dr. Mulabu Nguka joins me from New York, and we have a conversation about the implementation of the Women, Peace and Security Agenda in Africa. Dr. Fumzile Nlambo Nguka, it's a pleasure to speak with you today. Now, you became the executive director of UN Women in 2013, becoming the second executive director. But before that, you were MP in South Africa's first democratic government, and you took on several ministerial roles before you then became deputy president of South Africa. And as deputy president, you were tasked with tackling poverty, particularly the economic development of women. But your work support women started much earlier on in your career you were a teacher and then a coordinator at the world young women's christian association in geneva and you also have a phd in education and technology so you've got such an inspirational story talk us through that journey in developing your career towards playing such a central role in advancing women's rights thank you so much for having me my career was not planned actually i always wanted to be a teacher, which is what I trained to be. That's what my first degree was about. And then I was engaged with the the struggle against apartheid in South Africa. And then we had to live from day to day. In order to avoid being arrested in South Africa at some point, I joined YWCA and left the country to work for the YWCA in Geneva. But it was also an inspiring job that I truly enjoyed doing, working with young women around the world. And after that, I went back to South Africa. At that time, the regime was quite hard, especially on children. Children were disappearing, and it caused a lot of of pain and confusion for communities and parents. And later, we began to agitate for talks between all of the affected parties, which then led to the negotiations, which led to our liberation. After doing a number of things in South Africa, I then went to our first parliament, as we have said. And in Parliament, I worked on uniting the civil service of the country. That was my assignment as a leader of a public service committee in Parliament. Because if you remember, in South Africa, we used to have the different homelands, which were supposed to be independent. They had their own president, their own ministers. And when we reached liberation, this was just not a sustainable model, and this is what we also fought against. So we had to unite everyone and have one state. And after that, I became a deputy minister of trade and industry, and then a minister of minerals and energy, and then a deputy president. At UN Women, you're just coming towards the end of implementing your 2018-2021 strategic plan, which is based on lessons that you've learned from the previous plan, and both of them were implemented under your leadership. So in relation to the Women, Peace and Security agenda, one of the things you wanted to achieve with this new strategic plan was to move away from short-term, small-scale and UN Women-only projects favoring the larger scale, longer duration and multi-stakeholder impact for initiatives, and doing so in the context of the flagship program initiative women's engagement, peace, security, and recovery. So reflecting on implementing the 2018 and 2021 strategic plan, and specifically in terms of the WPS agenda in Africa, what would you say were your key achievements in the last three to four years? 
You know, the work for us with the African Union has been most rewarding. We not only had a, a pact between us, uh, then we did things together. Firstly, we focused on countries that had uh, the greatest difficulties. And as you know, in Africa, there isn't a shortage. We decided that uh, we would visit those countries in order to, in some cases, assist them with the development of their national strategic plans. But in some cases, to help the women coming from the different angles to actually come together and work together to provide an environment and an ecosystem for peace. We're doing that just as AU and South Africa initially, but uh, it was very important to me that uh, we created a much larger ecosystem that could work with us. So we were able to bring in several uh, NGOs. Of course, the AU family, the different players in the AU, we were able to bring in a civil society, women, peace and security, a forecast civil society on the grounds. And then we created a bigger organization uh, in every country in Africa working with us, which is the African women's leadership. And that is what has been very helpful in every country where we have a membership and in countries where we still have contacts and are still about to develop membership. Right now, we have 25 chapters of the African women's leadership uh, across the country. And uh, with them, we have then visited some of the countries that are highly affected uh, by conflicts uh, to support the women in those countries. Hmm. And if there was one gap that you would like to see the peace building industry address when it comes to WPS in Africa um, and f- that you'd like to see them do differently, what would that be? Not just in Africa, everywhere, it was to reduce the expenditure. Not, not on the military personnel per se, but especially on weapons and use the money to prevent conflict. Because if you prevent conflict, then you don't have a reason to fight. If you know what I'm saying, the army will not be uh, pushed to have to fight. We really would like a situation where more countries listen to communities. In many cases, uh, you would know that uh, just a well of water can become so complex that it sparks its own conflict in a country. Shortage of schools can be a problem. Shortage of infrastructure in general can cause people to be isolated, suspicious of each other, and then it can just degenerate and it ends up in a war. So yes, you know, less money on weapons and more money on the people. And now speaking of money, the the world changed in 2020 due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And one of the key things that it revealed was the extent of the inequalities in the world. Unfortunately, though, some of the more affluent countries are cutting international aid. So in the context of finance, women, peace and security agenda, particularly in Africa, I wonder what the impact of such cuts will be? Because, of course, we know the pandemic has already meant you know, an impact on peace building generally. And when you look at the expenditures of executing things like the UN Women's Strategy, which in 2019 was $110.5 million. So the implementation of the WPS agenda is going to require increased financial support. So in the context of the pandemic, international aid and the implementation of WPS agenda in Africa, What concerns you more when it comes to financing? Well, it has been a concern that the women's agenda in general is broke. That all work that has to do with women has a shortage of funds and the women's peace and security agenda is no exception. 
it has also been difficult in in many uh, situations to have the women themselves speak out for themselves, raise their issues, because as you know, if the affected people's voices are heard, it certainly makes a difference. But there are all kinds of difficulties associated with that. So I have, in the last few years, worked hard with the others to build the Women's Peace and Humanitarian Fund, which managed to conduct survey right after the pandemic in recognizing uh, the situation uh, of, of women in conflict in the midst of a pandemic. And it was clear to us that uh, certainly that the women we were facing uh, many more problems. We were able to receive more funds. And I have to say, and I am thankful that uh, we were able to reach out to uh, some women's group. But, you know, it is not the kind of money that would satisfy the needs that women uh, made. And then we also formed the Compact Framework on Humanitarian and Women, Peace and Security. That too has been a critical, it's not not only a fundraiser, but it has been critical for fundraising because the states, 23 governments that have come into it, the nine UN entities, and over 80 civil society organizations, they too have brought in some contributions to the kitty. Now, I mean, speaking of the compact, a huge congratulations to you and your team on the success of the Generation Equality Forum. Thank you. Yeah, it was one of the best virtual conferences I've experienced in the last few months. Now, and among the many sessions and commitments made during the forum was the Women, Peace and Security and Humanitarian Action Compact, which was launched um, at the forum. So, and one of the aims of the compact is to contribute to accelerating implementation of WPS and humanitarian commitments within the UN system and wider peace and security architecture through partnerships. So tell us a bit more about the Women, Peace and Security and Humanitarian Action Compact. We have wanted in Women, Peace and and Security to see better representation and participation of women. We have wanted to see the end of sexual violence. We have also wanted to see economic empowerment to support women to get them out of a situation where when even the conflict has ended, they remain in conflict in the manner in which they live. And the compact wanted to bring all of that together and bring also the humanitarian aspects. That is why it is, if you like, a nexus of humanitarian peace and security brought together. This has been important because, as you know, the humanitarian services take place and are supported in the governance of the UN by the General Assembly, and peace and security is supported by the Security Council. But to some extent, you can say it is artificial separation, right? Because a woman who who is a victim of a humanitarian crisis and a woman who is a victim of a war, if you die, you die. If you lose property, you lose property, etc. So we've wanted to bring these together so that we are able to work seamlessly between women who are affected by these situations. So it was great that through the process of generation equality, we were able to to sort of sail into that part of of the sea. And then secondly, younger people. I mean, it is my view that uh, if we don't harness and invest in young people right now, we risk becoming irrelevant and uh, we, we risk leaving those we want to be supporting most outside the tent that we think we are building. 
So what was also important for generation equality was engagement of young people. As you know, five years ago, the Security Council passed a resolution on youth, which bring uh, young, younger people into uh, peacemaking. We wanted uh, in Generation Equality to profile that, to create opportunities for these younger women to be engaged, be effective, and they did not disappoint. They were there, they are substantive, they know their work, and they want to work. They are not asking uh, for other people to run in front. They themselves want to run in front. Yeah, we we keep hearing that um, need for that intergenerational dialogue and engagement. And it was really great to see the forum have that real kind of um, coming together of the different generations in, in, in the various dialogues that happen at the forum. Now, one of the reoccurring themes from the interviews I've done for this podcast is the problem of implementation after peace agreements have been signed and the importance of having women at the negotiating table towards successful implementation of agreements. And of course, monitoring and accountability systems have been central to the UN and its member states in implementing the Women, Peace and Security. So how might we use such monitoring systems to improve the representation of women at peace talks within the objective of implementation? Well, uh, firstly, let me just say there is a lot of actors in the space. They all bring something that makes it better. And we will never know who really does what if we don't monitor and evaluate the work. We are glad that with the formation of the AWLN, we have women actors in all these countries who are also able to keep us informed and updated on the new actors as they enter the space. What we have decided, therefore, in Generation Equality and in the Compact is to create a possibility for these actors to report on what they are doing. We would hope that uh, every year at the Convention of the Status of Women, CSW, we bring the different actors in generation equality for reporting, that we produce the reports out of what we get from them, and that report is then presented and shared uh, around the world. During General Assembly, when heads of states are uh, in New York, it is a good opportunity. You know how hard it is to get heads of states, you know, it is a good opportunity to also report to them. We also want to bring heads of corporations, as you know, because, you know, a private sector contributes. We also want to bring in a philanthropists and civil society, of course, as well as traditional and religious leaders uh, into this. And it is important to recognize the work that all of them do. I want to emphasize what happens at a community level. If you think of a country like Burundi and Somalia, where peace workers have been quite uh, important role players in forging peace and in preventing the flaring up of conflict, those people need the support of their traditional leaders. They need the support of religious uh, leaders. So it is important to have traditional leaders also then in the compact so that we can all together work on pushing forward the ideals that we are trying to achieve. So now... As executive director, your overarching role was to lead the UN's work on advancing gender equality and women's empowerment. And uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has made us realize a number of things. Like I said earlier on, the extent of existing gaps 
and also the fragility of the progress we've already made. You said yourself that forecasts demonstrate, and I quote you, that without a change in course, an additional 47 million women will be pushed into extreme poverty this year, overturning decades of progress. This was a quote at one of your speeches. And we know poverty is one of the things that contributes to conflict. So as you leave your role at UN Women and reflecting on the last eight years, what message do you have for those coming behind you? How do we make sure we don't regress on the progress that women leaders like you and other women amongst, you know, like you said, our Lynn, that's our women leaders that work. How do we make sure that we don't regress on the progress that we've made in Africa's WPS agenda? Well, indeed, in Africa, you know, we have FEMWISE also in the AU, as you know, which, who plays an important role. Together with Aulin, we have Accord, which also is another organization that works on the continent. And the collective work, because all of the work that I've done, it's been with these organizations. It is important that uh, we don't uh, slip back. We actually, I want to repeat the importance of shifting money from weapons to people. It is critical uh, to do that because, as we have seen in COVID, no weapon could have stopped COVID. You know, uh, we have a lot of challenges that affect our people. Access to water so that they can maintain the hygiene that uh, we required at this time. We needed the infrastructure, the PPE and all of these services that we, we, we needed, uh, which were much more critical than a gun. So my biggest plea is really that we go back to the drawing board in terms of how we prioritize and we invest in the most important things to do. My other wish would be that the, the women in every country, whether it is at peace or at war, never forget those that are in countries where war continues. That uh, the solidarity of the women, by the women, which is what we have tried to build in AWLN, continues because I have seen that when you come as women of different African countries to a country in crisis, not only do you give hope to the women in that country, but you are able to engage with the leaders of those countries and sometimes move the needle a little bit forward. And uh, lastly, it is uh, important that uh, the peace processes that take place in the continent and the peace actors such as the UN, the different member states, the, uh, the AU, etc., all of those who are, whose voices are loud in the peace process, never forget women. It is for me important that they demand the participation of women before they participate. They can turn this thing around with a stronger political will and a demand for women. We have kept on hearing that, uh, well, you know, we cannot rock the boat uh, too much. Uh, the peace process will collapse if we demand too much. Why is it too much when we demand for women? So my call to them is to stand up for women. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Fumzile. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. Now, we've talked about your work and your professional background. And so to end the interview, can you tell us something about you that people will not find on Google? <laughs> well, this Google is so efficient these days. <laughs> you never know. Well, I don't know if there's if there's anything really s special about me except that I'm retiring, which is a good thing as a 65-year-old woman. Wow. And I actually am passionate about education. 
and the work that I will be doing in South Africa is a lot about education. And now that digital literacy is so important, ensuring that uh, women, schools, teachers advance in digital literacy so that there is never a time when children cannot be at school. You know that many girls did not go back to school after the, the yeah. lockdown. I want to find those girls and bring them to school because we cannot afford to give up on an 18-year-old who has so many years to live because we're just signing, if you like, a poverty check for them because all that will happen to them is poverty and they are likely to be abused in one way or the other. Thank you so much, Dr. Fumzile Mlambo Nguka. It's been a pleasure speaking with you today. You have been listening to She Stands for Peace, the podcast series that explores the state of the women peace and security agenda in Africa, asking the central question, 20 years after UNSCR 1325, how far have we come? I am Dr. Yemsi Akimbobola, your host, and this podcast was produced by the United Nations Office to the African Union with the generous support of the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. 